Hi all, I have another fascinating game from our Evolution of Chess Style series. So in this game, Paul Kaz was playing Black against Efim Geller. Now, for those of you who, for those of you who don't know, Geller actually had a great track record against the legend Bobby Fischer. He had actually uh, five wins to three with two draws. So uh, a very, very dangerous player. And I was fascinated to see uh, this clash, this mega clash, in the USSR 1951 Championship. For those of you who want to know my, my general roadmap, I want to cover key historical events, especially World Cham Championship events, and take what seems to be the most interesting and enjoyable and instructive games, which might have also had uh, the biggest effect on future generations. Now, in this game, I've chosen it because I think Paul Kerr's, his treatment of the Royal Pairs shows some real dangers uh, for both sides. Uh, let's have a look. So let's see. Bishop b5, a6, bishop a4. So this seems to be fairly standard stuff <clears throat> so far, pardon me. Knight f6. It seems absolutely bog standard how you play the classic Roy Lopez, especially in 1951. It seems absolutely default play so far. Uh, and that's what really excites me in a way because uh, it's the defaults which. If, you, if you're an IT person, it's the defaults which people will leave. It's like default play from both sides. What can possibly go wrong in this for either side? It seems just fairly absolute classic play up to a point. H3, knight, knight A5, and I'm sure many of you have seen this knight A5 with the idea of C5. It seems absolutely sound so far. Queen C7, knight BD2. I'm always a little bit uneasy if I'm playing the white side of this, that's why I don't usually like playing standard Royal Pairs stuff. You you need to know a whole load of systems that black can play as well. But from white perspective, I'm I'm uncomfortable when black can play C takes, and it's as if these bishops, this bishop on C two is now a tactical target, and to have to play bishop B one at some point seems uh, an inconvenience. Now here, uh, there's a question about the tension in the center, whether to push through with D five. Or not. Now, Efim Geller played knight f1. Perhaps d5, it seems to be more trodden nowadays. So, in that respect, in, in terms of the evolution of style, just from our this evolving day space of games, maybe, you know, this is like a key stem, stem game uh, of influence. Because here it seems d5 is now the established book move with this kind of position, where white has a small edge. Although White's conceded, you know, some dark squares here by pushing through with d5, this this seems to be a fine position for White overall. But in the game, Knight uh, f1 was played, and we have first this forcing move, Rook a c8. So White tucks that bishop away, and it's here. This really kind of intrigued me now. This next move is very energetic looking, d5. And one assumes it has to be, it has to be looked at with great care because it's, okay, it's potentially opening up this bishop, but it's also kind of opening up this bishop to h7. So we've got g2 at stake and h7 at stake for both sides. And this huge central tension now emerging here. Now, Evin Geller played with white, e takes uh, d5. White plays e takes d5. Uh, if knight takes e5, by the way, you know, you can look at the interactive PGN in the pinned comment of this video. Uh, so this situation uh, is a small advantage for black. So there's no big deal playing knight takes e5, it seems. So e takes d5, e takes d4, and then we have bishop g5. On knight, knight takes d4 should lead to an even position. Bishop b4 is an interesting, annoying move here. For example, this black can take and then get the knight to the center with tempo, this knight on the rim with tempo. And white has to be kind of careful, but it looks as though black should be fine here. Uh, so anyway, we see bishop g5, which has an echo that this bishop's gonna be dangerous on h7. Now black played h6. Uh, 
before we look at h6 let's look at knight takes d5 it leaves h7 behind here and actually that's reflected in a very dangerous variation that white could play here bang bishop takes h7 the greek gift actually comes in with a vengeance for example like this this is a big a, well a small advantage for white small to big it's dangerous looking uh, but even worse if the king came out dared to come out then knight g3 threatens the lethal queen h5 and for example like this this is really dangerous for black as you might expect uh, totally winning basically um so we see this move h6 which seems more cautious than knight takes d5 trying to avoid using this trick getting that h pawn out of the firing line of this bishop on b1 because otherwise i'm just <laughs> i'm just not convinced by this whole giving back black the c farm having to put the bishop on b1 i've always thought this is like awkward uh even though i'm not i'm not that royal piss guru i just thought this variation in particular seemed a little bit awkward so anyway there's a justification for that bishop it's avoided by, by moving that pawn so bishop h4 now here knight takes d5 is under safer con conditions queen d3 threatening the classic mate in one uh, on bishop takes e7 knight takes e7 queen takes d4 knight c4 b3 knight d5 uh, d6 this position here should be an even position as an example uh if so white could have taken that basically with an even position queen d3 instead we have g6 <laughs> this is really i i've been brewing this analysis for several days by the way and i've been thinking about this game i've been thinking there's something very witty about paul Keres which has been underestimated to play such a move either he's a fantastic calculator or he knows I think at some intuitive level he's aware that when you create downsides obvious downsides they're like magnets to the opponent to do something and that might in turn have upsides what he's done here with g6 he's clearly weakened h6 and the knight is also a liability on a5 we have two liabilities which can be actually the upside of liabilities is that they're they're magnet you can you can guarantee that they, they they're going to be magnets the opponent trying to exploit those downsides and as such you can actually use that as an upside for something you want to do knowing that it's a sort of magnet for what the opponent's going to do which is trying to exploit h6 and a5 and we see here bishop g3 so the first magnet is set up and it's made even more convincing by this next move bishop d6 because now we've got a second magnet set up <laughs> two liabilities on both sides of the board is this just reckless play from Paul Kaz? Because White's next move seems to tap into both. <laughs> this leads to the ingenious thing. Is Black losing here or what? Now, if this knight is moved uh, quite casually, then taking this pawn is not really good news as you can see white's definitely got a small edge there <laughs> i mean it's possible paul paul cares uh maybe made a slight mistake here and i thought he'd take a punt here on something uh trying to use this these liabilities and and it's and their exploitation to his advantage if white had instead uh played knight takes d4 the knight f4 is a pain for example here just the knight moves with tempo on the queen as can be a disaster for white um if a more sensible move um after knight f4 would be queen d2 uh sorry queen d1 but th then knight takes g2 and you see that this bishop the wrath of this bishop here and black gets uh a big advantage so it's actually quite dangerous this whole knight f4 business in this position so queen d2 uh yeah taking the queen out of knight f4 harm's way where the bishops actually open up as well with tempo so it seems to tick several boxes 
it's it's a magnetism to black's liabilities on both sides of the board it's away from knight f4 which is a tempo gain it's got everything going for it hasn't it guess what paul Kaz plays in this position which is genius absolute genius if i give you five seconds to pause the video <laughs> okay, knight f4. So, yeah, this bishop's wonderful. So that whole d5, it's making me think that maybe this is why the evolution of royal Lopez theory has evolved for d5 to be a bit more popular than the knight f1 because it, this bishop is not shut down. And even though black is off, you know, is giving up a piece here, which is taken. This bishop now shows its value. It takes on f3 simply, shattering white's king. Now, a very accurate play here is required to exploit this offside queen and the king's safety. Knight takes h3 check is played. This is the best, I believe. If queen d7, there's rookie four, and asking that knight to move. This position... Uh, for example, the knight can always be snapped off and the queen hasn't got too much support. It's an even position. But by taking out h3, things are actually more difficult for white here. On king h1, queen f4, queen a3, protecting the f3 pawn. Queen h4, it, sh it shows that the king here has got a lot of difficulty. Uh, this cuts any escape route through the center meaning queen h3 taking h2 is much more dangerous for example this is a continuation also uh, so it's all pretty dangerous here this whole scenario with king h1 so uh, here king g2 is played and we have knight f4 check and the beautiful coordination point is demonstrated after after another repetition in this position. Queen d5, threatening all sorts. Queen takes f3 as the major one immediately. Uh, but there's also an idea of potentially uh, queen g5, queen h, uh, queen getting to h3 in some lines. But this seems to be the major one. White just plays knight g3 here. You might think, well, why not try and block that with rook e4? Here, check is dangerous. If king h2, then that's checkmate. If knight g3, which is more sensible, clearly, then the back row, the weakness of this is that the back row, and you know what, I talk about that insecurity of playing move like bishop b1 earlier. Bang, rook c1. <laughs> Exploiting the silly pieces is, is lethal. Because here, queen h4, and we're going to get queen h3 now which is lethal the queen's totally offside on a dark square can't defend here so uh yeah so basically in this position knight g3 was was chosen on bishop e4 let's look at a few more defenses from um well this one anyway queen h5 so idea queen h3 to g2 let's say a4 queen h3 it's just mating on g2 this knight and queen is lethal you know, we've talked about knights on f4 or f5 being really aggressive. It's like Kaspar's favourite position for a knight. So this Paul Carras game is showing in these variations already. This is a lethal combination of queen and knight. Uh, d3, shutting down the bishop is played. In fact, here, queen g5 is also to black's advantage with the same, with, with an idea of h5 in particular, actually. Uh, because here the queen's on the light square it can come to the rescue with via b5 to f1 you know for example like this to f1 can come to the rescue just in time but black can change tune here to react to that with h5 and h4 and have a very good position this position there's no more real checks for white and the black king gets mobbed like this eventually here there's no there's no key checks that, sorry and, and the white kings had it but d3 was chosen which is another very strong move we have knight e4 queen f5 yeah the queen just wants to go to h3 
the this queen's still on a dark square even it can't even get to f1 now it's not really that it's pretty awkward the rooks got the the space on e1 for the queen to might have retreated we have queen b4 rook f8 and the game ended here actually after this move uh let's let's see the thing is this does set a trap if queen h3 here then ahem <clears throat> pardon me sorry if bishop takes d4 sorry rook f e8 if bishop takes d3 in this position not queen h3 because then there's a trap knight f6 check and taking out e8 check yeah this this is a nasty check because the queen is hitting the knight that's the key thing so this this is defended in any case so after taking that just take out the knight eventually that, so that's defending that so it's setting a nasty trap but um basically uh if here then to avoid this possibility black just plays rook takes e4 in this position and that avoids uh the queen and knight being lethal avoids defense against the lethal queen and knight rather uh, there's no defense here because if rook takes e4 check check and actually knight takes d3 check is forking king and queen <laughs> so it's after rook takes e4 this would be absolutely lethal if uh, whatever happens uh, so here is even worse because the king hasn't even got e1 it's checkmate there so I'll take you back to the final position of the game. The game actually ended here. So basically, black isn't going to play queen h3, but rather rook takes e4. And Evan Geller had a lot of respect to Paul Kares and didn't even want to test that with uh, bishop takes d3. Didn't want to test that. Uh, so for me, this was a fascinating royal pairs because as I say it's it's fascinating because it's close to what I consider like the default classic play in one of the most analyzed you know openings in chess history the classic royal pairs one of the most classic variations and we see the emergence that maybe why d5 to try and shut down the bishop to stop black liberating with d5 even though black created liabilities I I must think that Paul Carras, uh, had this notion that you know downsides are also upsides basically <laughs> that when you create downsides they're magnets for the opponent trying to exploit the downsides which creates an upside for you potentially so you have to be that witty basically about things in chess but from a theoretical opening perspective there's also some interest there in why the evolved d5 is now in our in our database from from a game like this which is pretty dramatic in a key tournament in 1951 so i hope you got something from that Comments, questions, like, shares, appreciated. Thanks so much.